Welcome to this week's Museum Learning Hub webinar, Virtual Exhibitions, Technical Workshop 2, Web-Based Curatorial Approaches. Brought to you by the Digital Empowerment Project, a nationwide initiative organized by the six U.S. regional museum associations and dedicated to providing free self-paced training resources for small museums. Our inaugural series of online trainings focuses on digital media and technology topics and is made possible by funding from the Institute for Museum and Library Services. My name is Justin Jakovac. I'm the Executive Director of the Mountain Plains Museums Association. I'm your host for today's program. I'm a white middle-aged male. My hair is brown and styled in a side part comb over. I have a mustache and goatee. I'm wearing a white button-down shirt in the background, there is a gray wall with a teal poster from a 1982 Smithsonian exhibition opening and an abstract painting that I picked up in the Gambia. In this era of virtual meetings, when digital spaces may substitute for our physical sense of place, it is important to reflect on the land that we each occupy and honor the indigenous people who have called it home. I am speaking to you from my office in Colorado Springs, Colorado, which includes the historic homelands of Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute peoples. Wherever we are each located, let us acknowledge indigenous nations as living communities. We at the Digital Empowerment Project recognize that our organizations and those of our members were founded within a colonizing society, which perpetuated the exclusions and erasures of many native peoples throughout the United States and beyond. We ask you to reflect on the place where you reside and work and respect the diversity of cultures and experiences that form the richness of our world and our profession. It is my, now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. Adriel Lewis is a community organizer, artist, writer, and curator who believes that collective liberation can happen in poetic ways. His life's work is focused on the mutual thriving of artistic integrity and social vigilance. He is part of the Ill Literacy Arts Collective, which creates music and media to strengthen Black and Asian coalitions, and is creative director of Bombshell Toe, a collaborative of artists and leaders from frontline communities responding to nuclear histories. Adriel is a curator of digital and emerging practice at Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, where he advocates for equitable practices in museums and institutions. His ancestors are rooted in Toysan, China, and migrated through Hong Kong, Mexico, and the United States. Adriel was born on Olone land. Please give Adriel a hearty welcome, and let's begin. Adriel, take it away. Hey, hello, everybody. Hello. How are you? So good to see you. Um, uh, let's let's get some folks in the chat. Just just say what's up or some quick responses are just kind of like popping some some ones if you can hear me or if you agree, things like that. Uh, just like to see some activity happening. Uh, I guess if that's possible on this platform. <laughs> um, I uh, am tuning in to you today from Tavangar, um, which is Tongva land. Um, I'm typing this into the chat right here. Um, and specifically in uh, Sangna, um, also known as Venice, California in Los Angeles. Um, here for over 7,000 years, um, the foundation of where I am it has been has been laid and stewarded by the Tongva people, um, as well. I'm going to type this out: Tongva people, as well as Chumash, um, and as well as Kish people. Um, so, um, as we as we begin this conversation, uh, I want to. Uh, ensure that we are um, thinking about deep history, um, even though we're talking about emergent practice and things like digital technology, that um, in order for these technologies to exist, in order for us to tune in right now, it's through um, continuous uh, 
complex relationships with indigenous history, with natural resources, um, with with um, forced and uncompensated labor, um, even with the very devices that we're tuning into each other from. And so being mindful of that, um, I don't take this hour for granted. I appreciate you all for tuning in with me and, um, and, and I, I set forth some intention for us to be able to leave this session more empowered and with more tools to do the great work that we do, which is to um, share knowledge, share culture, and to bring people together. Um, I'm also really thankful for um, Alexa, our ASL interpreter, as well as Madison, who you saw earlier and who will be joining us. Um, my sign, my name sign is a drizzle. Um, so uh, if you, uh, if you speak with ASL, feel free to refer to me as that. Um, so anyway, um, we're gonna begin. And I guess, uh, okay, I'm like, where do I get to see people tuning in? So I don't feel like I'm just talking to myself, but that might not be a thing. So anyway, I'm just gonna have faith that y'all are enjoying this and, um, you know, DM me uh, on Instagram if, <laughs> if you have any questions, I guess. Um, so, uh, oh, okay, I see, I see. Okay, you know what? I'm going to, uh, so Nancy is letting me know that I can actually watch myself, but that's gonna be a little bit distracting. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll tune in in other ways. Um, so my name is Adriel Lewis, and I am a curator at the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. Prior to that, I was a full-time artist and web designer and graphic designer and just kind of finding ways to do the hustle based on different skills that I picked up. Uh, and so that included uh, performing music, uh, performing and sharing poetry, um, and doing workshops uh, across the country around uh, bringing different communities of color together. And one of the things that really ties together um, all the different things that I brought to the table when I joined the Smithsonian is that so much of my work um, and so much of what I know has been cultivated in community. Um, whether that was growing up in the Bay Area in activism and art circles, or uh, by learning how to code and um, do graphic design through the internet, uh, just kind of grabbing source code uh, from websites that I liked and piecemealing things together so that I could uh, learn how to do some web design. And so today I mainly wanted to talk to you about a little bit about that journey and also about ways that I've kind of sorted out what my role can be uh, as a curator and as a web designer. So, um, you know, if you give me a second, actually, what I would like to do is not make Nancy relay comments all the time. If I just give myself a second to recalibrate uh, my cyber situation, I think we'll all enjoy the next while a lot more because I would love to just see your comments live as they come. So um, um, as, I, as I figure that out, um, I'll give you my visual description. Um, I am... Uh, an Asian man in his 30s. Uh, I am situated right now in what I lovingly call my Zoom throne. Uh, behind me, I have Momo, which is a, a, a clay ram uh, that I picked up in Denebakaya, uh, Navajo land in the Southwest. Um, I also have various plants that have been um, pretty much my my posse throughout the past year. Um, all right, cool, cool. And I think I see y'all. Okay, great, great. I see your comments. Hello, hello. Hello from Nashville. Um, I am wearing a black t-shirt and uh, and some shorts that you can't, that, that, that nobody can really see right now. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's begin. Um, what I would like to do is actually uh, begin sharing my screen and um, just do it for a quick second and then I kind of want to hop into a little bit of discussion but I wanted to just kind of give you a sense of what this hour is going to look like 
Um, you've probably seen the description. And actually what I can also do is pop this link into the chat. Um, or actually, yeah, if Nancy, if you don't mind doing that. Oh, here we go. It's going to be like me typing anonymously, I guess. OK. I'm going to figure out the stream. I'm going to figure out the StreamYard chat eventually. But um, I love y'all. Thank you so much for bearing with me. Um, OK. So we're going to go through a couple of different um, things. Um, and I have things out in basically four sections. Um, so first, we'll just talk a little bit about um, curation and being curators. Um, and actually, you know, we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more. I have some questions for, for you all. And then we'll talk about online elements, as in, um, you know, like, wh what are some of the decisions that I make when I'm curating uh, an online exhibition, um, you know, both as a technologist and also as a curator? And then I'll provide some suggestions on ways that, um, regardless of where you're coming from or your background with uh, technology or coding, how we can kind of like parse through what our roles are. And then I'll offer some examples of the projects that I've worked on. So you have full access to this. I'm not going to do slides today. So feel free to use this outline as you would like um, if you want to jump ahead or think through things or whatever. But um, yeah, we'll we'll just go ahead and begin. So I'm gonna I'm gonna great. Thanks, Heather. I appreciate that. Um, so I am a curator of digital and emerging practice at the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, which means that my business card has a lot of words on it. Um, so I'll explain a little bit of what that means. Um, so as as a curator, as my first curatorial role, which I've been sitting in since 2013. Um, so much of my job has really been about bringing people together. I think that if there is like a single liner of who I am as a curator, it's that um, my job is to find different ways for people to encounter art in community. Um, the center where I work, the Asian Pacific American Center, focuses largely on people of Asian descent, as well as people from uh, the Pacific Islands. Um, and we think about Asian Pacific America, not only from a domestic sort of Asian American and Pacific Islander American standpoint, but also from a global standpoint. So we think about the experiences of those living in the United States and its territories, but we also think about people throughout the world who have been um, impacted by globalization, by militarization, by colonization, and particularly from the United States. Um, the Smithsonian, uh, as you can imagine, has some colonial baggage. Uh, in the mid-1800s, the Wilkes expedition scoured the Pacific um, region, um, Southeast Asia, the Pacific Islands, the Western coasts of the Americas, and just took stuff killed animals, um, all for the curiosity and discovery and knowledge of people in, in the West. Um, there's been a lot of growth. There's a lot of reasons why I'm very proud to be at the Smithsonian. But at the same time, I think it's important working at a large institution or at any institution to acknowledge that history. Um, it's that history that makes it possible for me to be here and to do the work that I hope is productive. Uh, for, for the world. Um, that said, the center where I work uh, is not a museum. So I guess if you think about, for example, in 2015, 2016, we saw the opening of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. We're currently awaiting the opening of the National Museum of the American Latino and also the American Women's History Museum. Um, in uh, sort of the prequel to a museum is the existence of a center. Uh, for us, uh, we don't necessarily see a museum in any kind of tangible future. And somewhere like the Smithsonian, a lot of times I can feel like you're playing in the Little Leagues. But um, ever since I came in, uh, I think because I've always worked in underground culture, I've always worked in emergent culture, I, like, I loved when the internet was 
yeah, you know, newly available to the public and just kind of seeing it grow. And so I've really embraced the fact that we don't have a museum. I feel like it gives us a lot of opportunity to be imaginative, not only with the ways that we uh, present exhibitions uh, and not only with the ways that we use technology, but also with how we think about communication in general. I think one of the big gifts of the internet is that um, we have a forum for peer-to-peer -peer exchange, um, whether that's file sharing or knowledge sharing. And that really runs counter to sort of how we see traditional museums. And so within my own center, um, we have a staff of about a dozen. Uh, we have four curators um, and then staff that are doing operations and administration. Um, we don't even have social media uh, uh, personnel on our staff. We don't have a webmaster. And so even though my job as a curator isn't to build the Smithsonian APA website, I did. And um, even though my job isn't necessarily to uh, build out the frameworks or the templates for our online exhibitions, I do. And so that's my own particular experience that I know is um, a little bit unique compared to other curators, but I'm sure that all of you also have various experiences. So now that I kind of feel like I, I have uh, a handle on looking at this chat, I'm curious, do you mind popping in y'all like, um, you know, the size of your organization or institution? Do you identify as a curator? Um, if you don't identify as a curator, what do you identify as? Um, and I'm also curious, this is something that curators like to ask them, ask each other is um, like, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Which I know can sometimes be a very loaded question and very difficult to, to answer. I think one of the things that really kind of ties a lot of us together is that we spend a lot of our time uh, doing what we wouldn't necessarily describe as curating, um, you know, it's the close of the fiscal year right now, so I'm I'm uh, like writing out a lot of purchase orders and doing a whole lot of paperwork. Um, oh, cool! So Heather has a team of eight people. Um, Heather is a curator, uh, but yeah, all hands on deck, right? Like web design, marketing. We don't have a PR team on our side either, um, and not everything floats to the top at the castle. We don't get a press release for every single project that we do. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. 100 staff, head of production, solo librarian. How oh, tight. We got a librarian archivist in the house, curator on a staff of four. Beautiful. Cool, cool. Exhibition developer working on a syllabus. Director with a staff of, staff of two. Godspeed. The APA Center was, was, was one of those up until I would say 2010, 2011. Um, two staff, uh, Franklin Odo, our founder, and Gina uh, Innocencienzo, who was a uh, program manager and education specialist at the same time. Uh, curator of a 55-year-old community-born nonprofit museum, three full-time staff. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. So yeah, we have a lot in common. Um, I guess our, our staff is considered quite small at the Smithsonian, but um, you know, I, I've found that when I'm in circles with nonprofit organizations or grassroots, they're like, wow, 12 whole people. So um, yeah, I mean, so, so again, I think one of the things that ties us all together is that, um, you know, it, it, we consider it a luxury to have somebody who would be able to full time just be on tap to um, design our online exhibitions and things like that. Um, and so, the main thing I wanted to ask uh, and talk about in this part of the of this conversation is like, when when am I a curator and when when am I a webmaster or a web designer? And and how do I sort of set my guardrails, especially in an organization uh, where we have to be all hands on deck? And I would say that this question uh, relates not only to web design and not only to online exhibitions, but in general. Like, I mean, when I first came on to the center, um, I was curator, but also webmaster. And then also, um, social media person. 
Uh, and so I was like running the Twitter, running the Facebook, launching the Instagram. This is back in 2013. Um, and, and it was a lot. And I had my push notifications on, um, you know, getting, getting interrupted in dinner, getting pinged late at night, all that. And so part of it, you know, was really difficult was that, you know, working at the Smithsonian, people just assume that if you've got that Smithsonian handle, then you must be behind a major team that there's not even like a human being with feelings and the need to eat dinner and go to bed on time behind, uh, you know, behind the boards. And so I think setting those guardrails has been important, not only with the work that I do with the public, but also in the ways that I engage my staff. Um, sometimes that means uh, not jumping into things that might be opening a whole can of worms. Um, it means not necessarily activating a social media account every time that platform becomes popular with the public. Um, and I think one of the main things that is sort of my mantra as curator of digital is, you know, this is my opinion, yo, but to never do a project just because I'm enamored by the technology. Um, and I guess what I mean by that is like currently there's like a lot of fascination um, at the Smithsonian and also with a lot of other museums with NFTs. And so a lot of the conversations has been like, we've got to do NFTs, we've got to do NFTs. And there really hasn't been a whole lot of conversation about why or how or what would be the point. Um, you know, so NFTs are uh, non fungible tokens, they're um, uh, a blockchain based set of data that uh, that galleries and some artists have been using to sort of, uh, you know, create new frameworks of ownership for art in, and in particular digital art. Um, this isn't an NFT workshop, so I'm not gonna explain the whole thing, but uh, I just wanted to avoid any jargon in general. Um, if I do end up saying any jargon, please keep me uh, accountable, <laughs> uh, hold me accountable and let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to explain things. Um, cool, cool. So, so when I'm thinking about online elements um, for a website um, or for an online exhibition, um, there's a number of different questions that I need to think about and, and that I want to share with you all. Um, I guess the first question is like, wh what is an online exhibition? And what is the difference between an online exhibition and a website? Is an online exhibition a website in the first place? Yes, it is. An online exhibition is a website. Basically anything that you can pretty much open up on your browser is a website. It's, it's all pixels. And I know that that sounds really basic, but it's something that I also keep in mind often. Um, Prior to working in museums, when I was touring with my band, um, the way that I taught myself how to build websites was actually uh, I needed to promote the band and I couldn't afford a web designer. And so I just like started learning um, HTML. I would right click a website, click uh, view source code and just kind of go in and just figure out how to read it. Um, and then sort of just sort of build websites through that, right? Um, what really helped me by actually even just seeing code, even before I learned how to read it, was that I could see that it was all code. Um, a good reminder that it's all pixels. It's all just domains, pixels, text, and images. Um, so when we, when we hold currency on various websites, that's collective imagination. Um, when you go to, um, you know, um, scooby-doo.blogspot.com um, and read an article, and then you open up newyorktimes.com and open up an article um, and you place more value on one website versus another, um, or you feel prouder when your writing ends up on one website versus another. Um, it's all based on this collective consensus that the pixels that you see on the screen at nytimes.com are more important than the pixels, pixels that you see at randomwebsite.blogspot.com, right? Um, and so with the Smithsonian, um, I think it's, it's a similar situation, you know, like, uh, I recognize that the power that I have in being a webmaster is that because we have this prime real estate si.edu or smithsonianapa.org, um, you know, real estate that 
that people will place a certain kind of value or weight on it. And that's, that's value that we have to take seriously, but it's also um, an area of flexibility. It's a place where we can uh, bring representation and visibility to communities that in the past have been sidelined by ivory towers, by buildings that deem themselves more important than other buildings, by institutions that deem themselves more important than other groups of people. Um, this is all stuff that I've learned from the internet, ways that we can um, level the playing fields, democratize conversations, and 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 share knowledge. Um, so I know I'm rambling a bit, but um, I'm, I, I wanted to kind of set the stage for how I'm looking at online exhibitions, um, because oftentimes, uh, I encounter people who are interested in curating an online exhibition, and then they end up getting really caught up in, the th in, in questions around web design that typically wouldn't have necessarily been asked if it was a physical exhibition. Um, so one way that I might kind of break it down is, um, as a curator, um, our, our roles vary depending from organization to organization, right? So because I work at a big institution, um, you know, typically a Smithsonian curator at one of the museums, they're not drilling holes into the wall, um, hanging up the frames, um, putting things in display cases. There's entire departments and entire sets of staff who can do that, right? Um, if you work at a small museum, your experience is gonna be a bit different. Um, uh, I, I remember traveling uh, around and meeting a curator of a gallery who helped one of her artists deliver her baby. Like curators do a whole bunch of different things, right? Um, and and oftentimes are things that might not necessarily be found in your job description or in uh, the description of the job that you applied for. But if your job is to bring people together to experience art or history or culture, um, sometimes it just comes down to on a day-to-day -day basis, I do what it takes to get things done, right? Um, and in, in some cases, it, it is about building a website. Um, and so how do we actually go about doing that? How do, we, how do we make sure that we maintain the sanctity or the sanity of being a curator while at the same time opening the can of worms of what it means to build a website or, or things like that? Um, so, a couple of things I like to consider. One is uh, uh, thinking about different elements of a website, um, especially times when I'm thinking about like, oh, this would be really cool if I could like create this animated element or if I could make this thing, you know, uh, do something special when someone taps it or clicks on it. Um, I'm constantly having to ask myself if that cool gadget that I want to incorporate into the online exhibition is actually uh, conducive to the exhibition itself, the topic of the exhibition itself, or am I feeling like I'm just trying to showcase something cool that I saw on another website or that um, I would like to, to try and create, right? Um, it, it becomes really tricky because when, when you're kind of just putting together different kinds of content. You're thinking about different kinds of framework. You're thinking about how you want to uh, frame the text. You think about how you want to format things. It's very similar to a physical space, but in the same way that typically, regardless of how deep you are into um, curating or how small your organization is, at a point, there's a difference between, I guess, uh, installing an exhibition and actually like building the gallery like um, bringing in the bulldozer, uh, you know, setting up the frame, building the walls, and actually building the building itself. I um, mean, I think about that same thing with, with uh, building an online exhibition. Is my job to curate? Um, does it involve installing? And when am I starting to go into the territory of like building an entire website and focusing all of my time and energy and focus on figuring out how to build the website, figuring out how to fix the code, figuring out how to um, deal with bugs, as opposed to focusing on whatever the focus of my exhibition is supposed to be. Um, I hope that makes sense. And so the questions I ask is, is this element enhance or distract from the curatorial focus? Um, 
is this element conducive to my institution's goals? Um, you know, and let, let me speak a little bit less abstractly about this. I think, um, for example, let's go super basic, like um, a slideshow, an automatic slideshow on, on a website or an online exhibition. And um, if I'm thinking that I want to build an online exhibition and I'm like, oh my God, I want to do a slideshow, but I don't know the first thing about doing a slideshow. Um, that's the point where I'm asking this question. Um, is the slideshow uh, something that I think would just look really cool? Um, would it actually enhance the experience of the viewer? Uh, and if not, then it might be something that I can just let go. If it is something, if, if this slideshow is something that will really add value to the experience of uh, the viewer to this online exhibition, then I think that that's when it's worth it to go through the various questions of what it would mean to actually build that out. Um, and then some of the questions that would go into that is, um, what's the learning curve for implementing this element? Um, when I began building websites, uh, you know, I would go on various forums and sometimes doing something cool on a website is just some code that you can copy from a forum, paste into your code, and then sort of like switch out the different variables and then it goes live. And then sometimes it requires, you've got to go into, you know, databases, you've got to figure out other snippets of other kinds of code. Um, it becomes a whole thing. And then I have to sort out whether or not um, the hours spent learning how to do it, implementing it, and troubleshooting it is actually, is actually uh, going to pay out in the experience of this website. Um, if I can't be the one to do it, then, or no one else on my staff can do it, then I need to go into the realm of hiring someone else out to do it. And then the question becomes, um, what's the time and resource costs for this element? Um, how much would I be willing to pay for it? And then that goes into questions of um, affordability and also equity, right? So for example, if I'm building an online exhibition that's about, um, uh, you know, the history of um, labor rights. And then um, I want to build out this really cool website node. And I'm like, OK, I know. I can go on Odesk and just like hire someone in India for $3 an hour to build it out. Easy, right? Like, sure, you can get that done. It's very tangibly and affordably possible. But does that speak to the soul of what your exhibition is about? Are you still going about? Um, building this exhibition in a way that um, that is conducive to to what you're trying to convey to to the rest of the people, right? If you're building a website um, that's about the environment and about environmental sustainability, um, but you've got a bunch of different flashing colors and you've got uh, you know a ton of images that are taking up lots and lots of gigabytes of loading time, um, maybe not gigabytes, megabytes of loading time and things like that, then your website is actually uh, uh, you know, asking for a bigger toll from the environment. And then the question again is, um, are you just doing something that you think looks cool, or is it actually speaking to the soul of what your exhibition is about? Um, I guess, you know, like, you know, one more example is with accessibility. If if you're building an online exhibition around equity and accessibility, but then you really, really want to have these, um, you know, like moving, uh, you know, like th th these moving images that would be really difficult to add um, accurate descriptions to, or um, requires a lot of sound that can't be interpreted. Um, is that really following the soul of your of your museum? If if you're doing an exhibition about um, indigenous communities in rural areas, but then the website is not one that can actually load quickly in those areas. Again, it's uh, I think these are questions that are much more important than um, spending all the time figuring out like how do I get this really cool thing that I saw on this one website onto my website. Um, and so that that kind of goes into the last question that I have in, in this outline, which is like how sustainable and accessible is it? Um, so I know that I'm rambling a little bit, and uh, I kind of want to hear from folks in the chat while we give an opportunity for the, oh, the interpreters already switched out. Great. I, I hope that I gave, uh, gave you enough of a, of a break, Alexa. Sorry about that. Um, 
cool, cool. Um, let me let me just pause it here and let me ask if um, folks have any questions while I also just kind of catch up with some of the things that folks are seeing in the chat. Okay, so somebody's asking about an internship structure to help produce new projects. Um, I'll answer that the best that I can in terms of the context of the Asian Pacific American Center. Um, so with the internships that we do at the Smithsonian, and I think internships in general, like it's uh, it's not free or cheap labor, right? It's, uh, it's always about, um, about learning. And I think in, in my situation, because my focus is on the internet, um, it's about mutual learning. And so when I'm selecting interns that I wanna work with, um, I'm thinking about um, what can they learn from me, but also what can I learn from them? I love working with young people because um, they keep me, they keep me um, alert to sort of the ways that people are interacting with the internet. And I don't just mean like, oh, okay, look, everybody's using TikTok now instead of Snapchat, but more of, uh, you know, for example, the ways that younger folks um, are more naturally introducing themselves with gender pronouns. Um, to me, that's part of digital and emerging practice. Um, the proliferation of, um, of gender pronouns, of um, ASL interpreters, of live captioning. Um, these are due to disability justice demands that um, have been being made for decades, but that I think um, really picked up some steam, especially over the last few years, largely because of um, our ability to communicate with each other on the internet. In response, tech companies like Instagram need to start ad cast, need to start adding captioning um, as like widgets in their stories and things like that in response to the demands of the public. And so, um, you know, that's something that I really enjoy learning from, from young folks. Um, I think I don't really spend a whole lot of time like teaching people HTML um, or CSS or like the, you know, the very basic coding that I, that I know. Um, I'm more interested in helping folks get from point A to B um, from a least resistance sort of standpoint. So um, for example, with this conversation here where I'm essentially getting us to like, you know, what, regardless of how much code you, you know, um, how, do we, how do we go from having no online exhibitions to having online exhibitions that are dynamic, that engage the public, but that also stay focused on the topics of the exhibitions themselves. Um, cool, cool. So now I've got a couple of questions that are great. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll talk a bit about um, the differences between curating um, web web exhibitions versus um, in situ. I, I, I'm assuming that's like a tangible, uh, tactile exhibitions. Um, speak a bit about inclusive design when making online exhibitions, but are different, short, and, uh, exclusionary. Mm -hmm. um, and how have I tested the usability of virtual exhibitions in different areas, or is there a way to design your online exhibition to people who don't have access or good Wi-Fi or data? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are all great examples. Uh, those are all great questions, and I'll, I'll, I'll address them in, in, in the examples of the websites that I'll, that I'll share with you. Um, and I'll also speak a bit about the inclusive aspect of things. Um, to be completely transparent, um, my journey into disability justice is relatively new compared to um, my, you know, like I, I was an ethnic studies major. Um, I, I studied uh, gender and sexuality studies, but when it comes to disability justice, um, I really owe a lot of my introduction to that to the artist Christine Sun Kim, who I've been collaborating with over the last few years. Um, it was Christine who really helped me understand the value of um, learning basic um, American Sign Language and also like understanding accessibility, which is something that I really didn't think about too much when I was a freelance web designer. Um, you know, with with client work, it was always just about you know they wanted to get something done as quickly and cheaply as possible, um, and unfortunately, 
the, the conversation of accessibility just wasn't as prevalent as it is these days. And so I'll, I'll, I'll be first to admit that some of the projects that I'll show you, there's some accessibility functions that are worked into it, but um, one of the reasons that I haven't really curated a whole lot of online exhibitions over the last few years is because um, I'm just doing some learning around disability justice and figuring out how can I still, um, how can I produce uh, improved and top quality online exhibitions in ways where the accessibility functions are, are really enhancing the experience of the website for everybody. Um, I've seen some websites where you have sort of like an accessibility widget sort of built in, but then when you click on it, it's obvious that it was never meant to be clicked on by anybody because then the website goes all wonky or it doesn't work on mobile, things like that. There's like a ton of different considerations that we can think about and talk about. And um, I'll actually try and leave some room towards the end of this hour so we can unpack that a little bit more. Um, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll start sharing some of my, uh, examples as we actually talk through sections three and four. I think that might make it a little bit easier to um, visualize uh, what I'm talking about, but let me let me read through a couple more of these questions. Um, so, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, a lot of, so, okay, so this is a good question. Like, how do we measure success? Um, that's a whole can of worms. I wrote a whole paper about it. I'll share that with y'all later. Um, and uh, one of my favorite platforms for building online exhibitions these days. Great, Heather. That's exactly where I'm going to go into next. So to answer your question, I build pretty much all of my online exhibitions on WordPress CMS. So CMS is content management system. Um, there's other kinds of platforms out there. When I first started, it, I was using Blogger slash Blogspot a lot. Um, even prior to that, um, I was... Uh, if y'all remember MySpace, uh, when I when I was first starting to do some freelance, I was uh, uh, helping people build the headers of their MySpace pages. Um, back in the day, when you had a bit more freedom with social media, you actually had HTML boxes, and so you could basically build an entire website above the fold. Um, of your MySpace page. And that was a great way for musicians to link out to their other work or to sort of hack the platform because it only allowed you to share f up to five songs, things like that. Um, yeah, thanks for the link, Quincy. Actually, so the, the platform that I use is actually uh, wordpress.org. And so really quickly, I'll explain the difference between the two. Wordpress.com is, um, is a free service. Uh, usually if you see like, website.wordpress.com, that's, uh, that's the WordPress platform, uh, the wordpress.com platform. WordPress.org, when you sign into it, it's basically the same thing that you would see with wordpress.com, except it's an open source, uh, it's, it's an open source software. So what that means is like, uh, you actually install WordPress as a platform onto your own website. And then from there, you can, if you want to, you can go in and start you know, digging and hacking at all the different files. Um, typically within a WordPress.org environment, um, you wouldn't really touch most of the files, but it uh, where you have a bit more flexibility than a WordPress.com platform is that you can um, access this like marketplace of plugins and templates to sort of build things out. So going back to the idea of the slideshow, um, you know, if I want a slideshow that's a lot fancier than the kind of slideshow that like a default WordPress.com uh, website might allow me to build, then I can go into this like open source marketplace where I can install a plugin for, you know, specifically the kinds of slideshow that I might be looking for, or I can download or buy a certain template, and then I can go into that template, and then I can change the code in that. Um, so. It allows a lot more flexibility. And one of the great things about WordPress.org is that it's become um, a lot more accessible in terms of uh, creating tools where people who are not as familiar with code can still go in and do a lot of nice and fancy things. So I'll actually go in and kind of share that with you. Y'all are seeing my screen, right? I'm like trying to look at like various tabs of myself, including the chat and the stream yard and my own browser. So. Um, cool, cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll share. I'll share the back back end of it. And I know folks are asking more questions, but I'm gonna just kind of address some of the things I've already 
uh, read first. So looking at my screen, um, this is a uh, this is an online exhibition that I curated last year with um, a gallery called uh, I A N A at Hillier. Um, it's a DC-based gallery organization, um, and it's it's a very simple website. This is the whole exhibition. Um, what I wanted to do with this exhibition was to create a space where people could um, essentially not feel overwhelmed by an exhibition. I think a lot of times when I go on a website um, that I've never been on before, it's kind of like entering a mansion and I have no idea which room to go to. I'm like, I'm just trying to get to the bathroom. How do I get there, right? And so I wanted to create an exhibition and I, and I tend to do this with a lot of my exhibitions where like, you know, I, I do this a lot when I go on any website where I'm like, okay, how long is this gonna take, take me, right? And so um, with here, I'm like, okay, there's um, gonna be a curatorial statement and then there's four artist works. Okay, I can get through that, right? And so then with this, each one basically <laughs> expands. Um, I, you know, again, thinking about, um, one of the things I've been thinking about during this pandemic era is um, how do I mind, how can I be mindful about um, the additional time that I'm asking people to spend in front of a screen? Um, and it's one of the reasons why I haven't just been putting out a whole ton of online exhibitions um, or, or doing a whole ton of Zoom projects because I know how worn out I get by Zoom and things like that. So I try to be very mindful with it. And so keeping the, the text brief. Um, and then with each of these projects, um, to address the kind of situation between an online experience and an in-person experience. One of my ground rules as a curator is that if I'm doing an online exhibition, uh, I'm only doing it because it the experience of this exhibition is enhanced online. It doesn't feel like it's a substitute to being in person. Um, so with this exhibition, um, which was basically about, um, the, the idea of this exhibition initially started when um, I was supposed to go to Seoul in South Korea to do an artist exchange and then eventually put together an exhibition in Washington DC featuring media artists from South Korea as well as Washington DC. Um, since that didn't work out with the pandemic, instead um, I found uh, two artists based in Seoul and two artists based in DC, um, each working in different mediums to really think about how we can create a sense of presence, even though currently we can't be so present together. And so, for example, with Nara Park, who's a DC based artist, um, Nara is a sculptor and uh, her work has always been very tactile. But um, during this period, she started working with um, 3D sculpting and 3D printing. Um, so this piece over here is it's a JPEG. It's it's all code. Right. But um, this is actually not a 3D rendering. This is a photo of a 3D printed piece that she 3D rendered. <laughs> so so uh, she took a picture of her foot, a 3D scan of her foot, and also this rock. Um, and then she uh, and then she she did what she did with it on on her computer, and then she printed it out, and then she took a photo of it. And then this is the digital photo of that. So. With that, we felt it was most important for someone to be able to see the detail. Now, normally in a gallery, you can only get so close to a piece like this before the guard comes and wants to tackle you, right? And so um, we were like, okay, well, this might be an opportunity to really let people zoom into something, you know, uh, in a way that they might not typically. And so with this project, uh, we decided to just Oops, now I'm zooming into my browser. browser. Uh, we decided to allow for people to access like a super high res version of each of these images where you could then kind of zoom or pinch in. And as you can see, it still gets a little bit wonky sometimes. So all of this was just a little bit of an experimentation. And then we have our text. Um, with this piece, um, Lisa Park, who is based in Seoul, um, developed a series of videos 
where she was um, reading her biometric data as she was doing various things that she was doing during the pandemic, you know, like eating, working at home, things like that. Um, I won't I won't necessarily play these videos, but where, where I wanted to get at, get at was like because because with Lisa we were showing multiple videos and um, even though some of these videos are like eight minutes long, for example, uh, they're not, the, the point wasn't necessarily to expect people to watch each video all the way through, because at a certain point, you kind of, you kind of get the point of what it is without having to watch every single video all the way through. And we sort of expected that. So we sort of envisioned this as like, if you were seeing each of these as, I don't know, um, tablets hung up on a wall, you might not stand and watch every single one in the gallery. You sort of walk by, kind of get the point, and then that's sort of it. Um, so we felt like sort of just embedding it normally was a good way to go. And then, um, and I would say the same thing with um, with Julia Kwan. So uh, we have these JPEGs that just sort of look like they look very normal, um, you know, like in a way where it's like, okay, I I don't under really understand. Um, what is the work that went into this? And so we actually accompanied this with um, a process video where um, Julia could actually show um, how time intensive it was to create each of these prints. Um, we, we also, when this exhibition opened, um, put on a fundraiser uh, to various causes so people could actually receive um, physical prints if they, uh, if they contributed to the fundraiser. And then with Younghei Chang Heavy Industries, um, they created one video work that is a is a piece that we wanted folks to watch all the way through and not kind of only watch a little bit and then scroll past. And so the decision was to not embed the video, but instead to make it a light box, um, which is you know something that that everybody's seen before if you've been on any kind of website where you can zoom in zoom into an image. And so with this, once you play the video, you know that you're locked into it for. Our, um, four minutes, and there's not really an opportunity to scroll away from it. And, and that was more of like thinking about going into a dark room screening experience and how usually those are the kinds of um, video works that you really, you know, you're, you're staying until it loops back again or until it gets from the beginning to the end. Um, so yeah, e even though we had three, three artists who had video in their, uh, in their exhibition, in, uh, in this exhibition, we sort of framed the video in various ways. Um, and I would say that each of these was kind of done by way of plugins and things like that. Um, let me check to see if there's any particular questions. Cool. Great, great. Um, so I know that I know that this hour has kind of flown by, and I apologize for that. Um, I hope that I got. I got some of the points across uh, in terms of what I'm thinking about. What I can what I can speak to tangibly, just because I know that folks are coming from various um, experiences, is that um, if something like WordPress seems a bit uh, too intense, um, I think Squarespace is actually a good way to go. Um, Squarespace can cost anywhere from ten to fifteen dollars a month, um, and so when you kind of think about you know, like building a website, you're gonna you're gonna want to pay a web designer a minimum of two thousand dollars, right? Um, but with Squarespace, you can at least sort of start playing around with things. You don't necessarily need to know how to code, and you can do a lot of the kinds of like basically, I could have built this website, um, this exhibition on Squarespace. It has all the kind of bells and bells um, that one might want to try out. So if you're kind of like just jumping into things and and really trying to figure out like what can I do. What, how can I bootstrap an online exhibition? I recommend Squarespace. Um, I used to use Tumblr a lot too for online exhibitions. I loved Tumblr, but um, and one of the main things I loved about it was there was a really built-in community because it's a social media platform. Of course, um, folks have kind of abandoned Tumblr, so I stopped, I stopped really using it so much. Um, yeah, I know I'm running out of some time, so. And I hear someone. Well, thank you so, so much. I, you did a really uh, comprehensive round about the uh, uh, the subject here. I wanted to give you a chance before we before we jump off to 
throw links in for any uh, exhibitions that you curated online, if you're on that on that chat space or what have you. Um, um, and then kind of looking down the down the list of things to see if there were any any final thoughts or questions that you wanted to answer before I do a quick uh, wrap up and little plug for next week and that kind of thing. I do see one new question from Nancy. <clears throat> what what do you recommend for long term exhibit and content? <laughs> Uh, longevity preservation. Oh my God, that's uh, that's that's such a good question. I mean, um, social media is is um, the least stable place to go, right? Like I've lost so much data to platforms like Flickr or LiveJournal um, because they change ownership or they change the terms of use that I, um, you know, could no longer kind of get with. Um, what we do at the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, which I'm not necessarily officially advocating for because it, it was sort of like a little bit of a, of, a, of a punk thing to do. Like we actually purchased a outside server from si.edu. And that was simply because back in 2013, 2014, um, if we wanted to build our own websites for our organizations, we had to use Drupal, which is a different CMS platform that um, I just don't like that platform at all. Um, and, and I didn't know how to use it. And so um, in order to actually get a website up and running, we um, went on Bluehost, um, purchased smithsonianapa.org, and are still kind of like running a pirate ship. Our whole website is, is a bit of a pirate ship website, much to the um, annoyance of our, of our tech team uh, at the Smithsonian. But, but they, they, they're, they're playing along nicely, and, and they've been fine with it. And it's actually become a bit more of a regular protocol. I've, I've learned that most Smithsonian museums have a pirate ship web server for for yeah. quick use. That's a great point uh, for, 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 for everyone, for the small museums out there too, right? Like it's a pretty mm -hmm. level playing field from that perspective. If you're running it in the house, you're not, you're not doing something with big Smithsonian that they can't replicate. And you saw mm -hmm. a lot of our audience is, is of that size, right? That they need to be able to mm -hmm. replicate it on their scale. So again, thank you so much for, uh, for, for being here today and for sharing your, uh, your expertise. I'll uh, encourage you to, as well, Adriel, to look at the forums for questions that our audience is gonna continue to share. And just, uh, we're looking for um, the type of feedback really loop that you built today. Uh, so thank you again for engaging our audience and for sharing all your expertise. Uh, just a couple quick program notes for the end of the day. Um, Visit the forum on the website to ask questions. Follow us on social media. We're going to be doing technical workshop three, exhibition design in virtual environments with uh, Dr. Natrice Gaskins, who's a digital artist, academic, and cultural critic from Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, thank you again for joining us today. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Take care. <laughs>